So you just bought your first project car or truck. It's something old, hopefully from the 60s, 70s. You don't know a dang thing about it, and you want to get it running and driving once again with just limited hand tools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Junkyard Digs, and welcome to exactly that, because that is what we are going to be doing today with this 69 F100 that's been sitting in my front yard for a couple years. Let's get it going. All right, so today we're using our 69 F100 as an example. I worked on this truck about two years ago. Bought it from my buddy Jed. It came out of Oklahoma. Nice, clean truck, but it just barely ran at the end of that video, and I've been meaning to get back into it, and I never really could find a theme for it or a purpose for it to be in a video because hopefully it doesn't need a lot. With that being said, I figured this would be the perfect vehicle to really kind of rough it out here today. Uh, we're going to try to fix this with just simple hand tools that everyone should have at home in the backyard. No fancy shop, no lift, no tools. Me rolling around in the mud for a couple days to try to put this truck back on the road to prove to you guys that this is something you can go out and do. This is essentially how the channel started was rolling around in the dirt, fixing cars. So let's crank the clock back and do it old school. All right, so step one, you're gonna reach in here. This is a good thing to do before you buy it, by the way. Reach in here, see if your carburetor moves. If it does, that means there's a good chance there's not a lot of moisture that's gotten into this engine and it should hopefully be free. Step two, reach down, spin your fan. Obviously in this case, we have a clutch fan, which means it is not mechanically linked, uh, directly mechanically linked to the motor. So I can't spin this to see if this motor is going to be able to spin. If I'm strong enough and lucky, and this is a low enough compression motor, Yes, look at that. I'm actually able to grab this smaller pulley and confirm that this motor is not stuck. On a Ford, the center crank bolt is a 15 16 On a Dodge and a Chevy, go ahead and tell me in the comments because <laughs> they vary greatly and they're a lot smaller. The Ford's got a nice big bolt and it's universal. Pull your dipstick out, take a look at that oil. Ooh. <laughs> Wow. Okay, well this side's not bad, but this side is disgusting and all sludgy. She's gonna need an oil change. Maybe a motor. Hopefully not. Because then my idea of an easy revival goes right out the window. <laughs> what you're looking for there is, well, that. And water. Specifically, if the oil level seems really high, there might be a bunch of water in the bottom of the pan. Uh, you also want to take it out and smell it. If it smells like gas, that means the engine has a lot of blow-by and a lot of fuel is slipping past the piston rings and down into the bottom of the crankcase and diluting the oil. Get that changed right away, but other than that, that's a sign of blow-by and a worn-out motor. Next up, transmission. It's all over my nose now. You're trying to smell if it's burnt. If it is burnt, your clutches have seen some some bad times and it might not have a working trans. Next up is your coolant. Pop your cap off. You're looking for a whole bunch of white crap on here. A little bit, not really a big problem. Even on newer cars that kind of happens because condensation forms on the top if you only drive the car to church and back or to the grocery store and back. But if this is all just disgusting looking and in here is a diabolical nightmare, there's, there's potentially some head gasket issues or something going on. So at this point, I've determined everything looks like it might be okay in here. Not exactly a motor I would immediately depend on driving a couple hundred miles or across the country. Then again, sometimes they make it. Looking at you, wagon. All right, so I've sourced ourselves a battery. Thank you, plow truck. You should have two connections, obviously. One is going to go to the block. That is your negative. Don't pay attention to the color. Pay attention to the routing. The other one, by process of elimination, is your positive on a Ford. He's going to go right here to the uber convenient starter solenoid. Oh, hey, you know what? I've been here before. <laughs> that leads me into my next point. Uh, if you're by yourself and you want to make life easy, all you need to crank, not ignition, just crank in a Ford, is to take power from the battery, be it right here or here, take positive power, and run it to this first solenoid. You can do that with a pair of pliers or you can rig up a button, like I apparently did once upon a time. With that being said, if all's good and I hit this button, it should be the same as turning the key to start. Sweet, she cranks. That means that the cranking system side of our electrical is good. The only other electrical we need to work to make this run is to have 12 volts to the positive side of the coil, be that with a wire uh, that we rig up from the battery or with a functional key. In this truck, we're lucky enough to have a functional key. So let's go turn that on and see if we have spark. Oh yeah, that's right. This is the truck where the switch 
it's supposed to be up here in the column that the text when it's in neutral or park has been taken off and I have to like finagle it to the right position to get it to crank. So like I said, in this one we have a functional key, we're gonna turn it to on. And then we, or our buddy, is going to come up front and disconnect the coil wire. The coil wire is the one that's in the center of our distributor. What you're gonna to wanna to do here is grab this sucker nice and look for cracks first of all and then grab him nice and far back so you don't get shocked and put him right next to some piece of metal. If there's a bunch of fuel all over this, don't use that. Put that right next to a nice ground, have everybody crank it with the key on and you're gonna watch for spark right here. As you can see, we have nothing. So, being that, ow, my head, again, kind of annoying, you know that? Again, being that this is a points vehicle, no dirt spark box. We need to get into our cap and rotor here. Get your handy dandy pliers. That piece there with the wires on it is your cap. This is your rotor. Take him off, set him aside, and remember to put him on later. If you're lucky, you can stick him to the cap so that you remember that. Inside here, you have your condenser, your points, and your distributor shaft. This distributor shaft has eight lobes on it that correspond with top dead center on each cylinder. And when those lobes open these points, oh, I must not have had a very good ground. They appear to be working. When the lobe opens the points, as you can see, it interrupts the ground that runs to this coil. And when that ground is interrupted, the coil discharges all of its built up energy out of this wire. Generally, if you have spark jumping out of your points just like that, that means that your points are working. They are disconnecting and reconnecting just fine. So that's not my problem. I must just not have had a good enough ground on this dirty brass piece. Uh, side note, don't reach in here and open this with your finger. It will shock the shit out of you. That's the only spot you can get shocked on a vehicle with a DC battery is in the ignition system, such as the end of this wire or the end of any of these wires. This is 10,000 volts. This is 12. I could lick both of these and I'd be fine. Now, if you don't have spark here and you can reach in and open those with a screwdriver, an insulated screwdriver, and nothing happens, that means those points are dirty. Get a piece of sandpaper and clean those points off. Clean in between them. You've seen me do it in videos all the time. And then get a edge of a shop towel or the cuff of your shirt and get it in between those points and pull it through a couple times and get all that sanding material out of those points. You can clean points all day with a piece of sandpaper, but if you don't clean them afterwards to get the sandpaper dust out, it is never going to run. And I should probably mention there's a good chance that they will get dirty again in a couple minutes and you might have to do that two or three times. So we've got spark at our points, put our rotor back on, get our cap back on here, take this guy, find a different ground and test him again. So hopefully as you can see we have spark jumping out of our coil wire that means our points are working our coil is working if you still can't get that to work no matter how much you clean those points that ballast resistor in there may be bad or your coil may be bad easy way to test the coil disconnect all these take a wire from the positive side of the battery to the positive side of the coil and then a wire from the ground to the negative side and brush that negative side against the coil post and if it makes spark out of your coil wire, your coil is good. If it does not, your coil is actually bad. I've only ever come across one bad coil. All right, enough talking. Let's hit this thing with a little fuel and see if it makes some noise. I'm noticing something. It's only running when I'm hitting this. Yep. As soon as I let go, it shuts off. So what's going on here is I have this ignition solenoid and it has two outputs, one and two. This one's for the battery. This one is a bypass to give the ignition coil 12 volts directly. Usually coils run on nine volts, but when you crank the engine over, the battery experiences a voltage loss and the coil only gets like six or seven volts and that's not enough to fire it off. So what they've done as a workaround here is when this solenoid engages and turns the starter on, it also sends 12 volts to the coil to help overcome those cranking losses. What I'm seeing right now is that as I'm cranking with the key, the engine is running. But the second I let go, like you see there, it turns off. So my nine volt regular source that's supposed to be running this all the time with the key on is currently failing me. It's going to be in the key and a ballast resistor if it's a Dodge 
or I don't know where or what's going on <laughs> with this Ford. So let me look around, see what I can find, and I'll tell you what I found. All right, alternate plan. Take this, put it right there, and then figure out how to hit the key. again. Okay, there. <laughs> that was a, a fight and a half, but we got a motor that runs. I hear a ton of valve noise over here. Uh, the clanging noise we heard was this hitting the shroud at some point, because as you can see the shroud's held on with a piece of wire, but we have an engine that runs. At this point, it's time to take this carb off and rebuild it. I usually take these and throw them in my ultrasonic cleaner, but not everyone has one of those. So we're gonna try some alternative methods of getting this carb clean. Something you guys can do at home. Probably a good time to mention you don't need fancy expensive tools, especially if you're just working on these here and there. It's the guys that are doing this every single day, all the time, or the guys that like a really organized shop and can't afford it. Those are the guys that should be spending money on Tang tools and other brands. Personally, I prefer Tang because of their excellent organization systems. I mean, it's, they're just unrivaled in that category. Boxo is another brand that has that. I've used some of their tools. Let's just say I prefer Tang. I'm not gonna be one to throw a brand under the bus, but I'll tell you my preference. With all that being said though, as you probably noticed, the main box I use in our shop is a bunch of Craftsman wrenches I've had for like 10 years now. <laughs> In fact, once I get this off, we're going to take it over to the little shed that I've got out here on the farm and we're going to use exclusively Harbor Freight tools. Like that's the whole thing is just full of Harbor Freight tools. For the most part, a wrench is a wrench, just like oil is oil. That sentence should give this video a lot of comments. There we go. Let's take this to the shed. I'll show you how to rebuild it. Now, before we get started, I would like to mention, usually I just replace carburetors to include two barrels. These Motorcraft 2100s especially seem to be quite finicky and temperamental to where I still, to this day, have only successfully gotten one of these to work and properly idle without the choke on full after rebuilding it. If you're in a pinch, you can rebuild these. Don't set your expectations high. What'll happen, even if you clean everything out and it's perfect, what'll happen is these, over time, the throttle shafts, the shaft right here, it'll wear out the carb base plate and they will leak air through here as carb, it's all carburetors do it, but old carbs will leak air through here and you have to bore them out and put new seals in and you can rebuild the carburetor to where it's perfect, but it literally requires a machine shop. So with all that being said, let's try to rebuild this with a bottle of brake clean. <laughs> we're, we're just gonna try to get this sucker to run enough to move around for now. We got four bolts on top and then this center stud. Beyond that you also have your choke linkage but mine's broke off so I ain't gotta worry about that guy. -da. Here's our Venturi assembly, our two Venturis. This is our float, our needle and seat. It actually honestly looks Pretty dang okay in here, as far as things go. But I know from running this previously that this truck has a bad power valve because this thing chugs black smoke and would idle really rough and really rich. And I had to have the choke open all the time and the throttle open to like here just to get this thing to even run. And up top at RPM it did okay because it was able to process all that fuel. So I'm hoping that this thing's pretty salvageable and will be nice to us. Let's get our float out of here, coming with the screwdriver. Pop that spring out and lift that whole assembly out, set him aside. Ideally, you've turned this upside down and emptied all the fuel out while it was still fully assembled. Uh, don't take this and dump it out 
on the ground because there might be some stuff in here that's loose. I like to dump it out on a rag on the counter so that if any check balls or anything fall out at any point in time, they don't just disappear onto the floor. Especially when you got big holes in your floor like I do that just lead to oblivion. And down here in the bottom of the bowl, we have our main jets. One and two. That's left and right. This is our seat, our needle and seat, which looks like it's been replaced, honestly. Uh, this is our Venturi assembly, as previously mentioned. Let's go ahead and pop him out. Got one screw right in the middle. He will have a gasket on him. This is your Venturi assembly. These are the emulsion tubes. Huh, look at that. I've never seen that before. You will have a rod sitting in that hole where you just took that screw out of, and a check ball. Ooh, little dude about went to oblivion. Hang on to those and make sure they go back in that order. Check ball, then rod. Ah, Jesus. Pop this main jet out. There we go. Also a 54. Make sure they match. And we'll go ahead and remove our seat. This usually takes a very wide screwdriver. There we go. You will have this cup, which is a crush washer, which will seal him to the bottom. It's probably a good time to mention if you remove a seal, such as this one right here, they're rock hard, they've been sealed for a long time, but as soon as you break that seal, he's not gonna wanna seal anymore, so you need to replace it. All right, that's pretty much everything inside the body of our carb. Let's move to the front and take off our accelerator pump. These are either screws or quarter inch bolts. This one is quarter inch bolts. Keep some pressure on this cover because there is a spring in here, and he's gonna want out. Flip him out of the way. Boop. There we go. Surprisingly, this was not blown, but if you look at it, it's all janky and sideways, and you can see that it's pretty much petrified and it would not have lasted long. I think it was already leaking, to be honest. Next up, this bottom cover right here, this is our power valve. This is essentially a vacuum controlled switch that midway through your RPM range supplies a little extra fuel beyond what the main jets can provide. Oop, a little fuel in there. T is blown. So, yes, this is what I was anticipating. There's a diaphragm right here that separates this vacuum chamber. This should never be wet. See all the fuel that came out of there? That means it was absolutely blown. This should always be dry. There's a seal within this power valve, that black seal right there, that separates that vacuum chamber the bowl because as you can see that right there and down there that last little piece is the power valve when that seal fails fuel from the bowl falls down into this cavity and then through this vacuum port right into the motor and it just starts chugging fuel it's pretty common that these go bad just from sitting for a little bit they'll actually like like a winter or two winters they'll get stiff and they won't actuate at the right time like a six and a half power valve will come on at four and a half because the diaphragm's got stiff. But this is an extreme case of failure, wow, that wasn't even very tight, where the diaphragm is completely shot. I've seen this twice. Ironically, the other time was on that 68 bump side that Luke, Mook, and I did years ago that's sitting right next to the one we're working on today. So this guy is our culprit, our main culprit, I should say, as to why this engine is running so poorly. With that being said, next up is our idle adjustments. We're gonna see how far they are out right now. Two turns, two and a quarter, okay. Usually it's only like one, one and a half turns to idle properly, uh, but I found these old motorcrafts for some reason are like two and a half. I don't know if they just meter differently or what's going on, but that is not the first time I've seen that. I believe the last thing is the aforementioned rubber dude. You can pull your throttle slide out if you want. Just know that these screws are knurled which means they're screwed in and then hammered from the back and flared so that they don't fall out into the motor. I'm gonna try to be lazy and leave them today because I don't have these gaskets. Hopefully they survive the carb dip, we'll see. The last thing I need to worry about is this gasket and then finding a gallon of Berryman's Carb Cleaner. I will get this off, acquire that, and we'll be back. Alrighty, we're back from the store. I've got ourselves some Berryman Chem Dip Carburetor Parts Cleaner. I used this stuff for years before I finally got myself ultrasonic parts cleaner, which is what I use today. That and some pine salt. You can also boil your carburetor on pine salt, but I uh, wouldn't suggest doing that. 
if you have a significant other that shares the same house as you because they might get upset. This stuff works really good. All you do is take your carb, throw it in there, lower your parts down into the bucket, wait an hour or so, and then come back, flush it out with warm water, and then spray all the orifices and ports out with brake clean or compressed air, and it should come out nice and clean and work out pretty well. Yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> Let this sit for a while and come back and rinse her off. I might have to rotate it to get the other side and then obviously two more washes, so looks like I got my day cut out for me right here. All right, it has been a little bit. It's time to flip this sucker over. Step one, of course, is get it out. There we go. Look how much cleaner that is already. Wait until you see it hit the water. It doesn't quite do what an ultrasonic does, which is create cavitation on the surface and take all those particles and explode them off on the inside as well, but it does do really good at cleaning carburetors. This will get you by most of the time. Like If, if this doesn't fix it, it was probably time to throw it away anyway, honestly. Look at that. And it's been a long time since I used this stuff and I forgot how nice of a surface finish it leaves. That is awesome. Still a little bit of crap in there, but I still have to do the whole other side. You can see the difference of the part that was in the liquid and out of the liquid. There you go. Good old double dip. And we'll be back in a half hour once again. My balls. All right, good morning, folks. As you can see, I've got our body all cleaned up. I went through with some brake clean this morning, sprayed out every single orifice. Went down to O'Reilly's and got ourselves a rebuild kit. The one I had sitting around was missing a couple of crucial components, so I had to go get a new one. We're gonna start with our Venturi. I have both the emulsion tubes pressed back into place like they're supposed to be. Drop our gasket on there. Before he goes in, remember, check ball. It goes down in this threaded hole. Weighted rod. What these both do is keep these from constantly flowing. They only allow fuel past them when there's pressure applied via the accelerator pump. It's actually easier to drop this guy in and then this guy. New gasket on him. Get that rod to go up inside. Make sure he's fully seated. Next up, well, we got the big screwdriver out, our main jets, they cleaned up real nice. Looking through them, they look great. If you ever have trouble with jets, this is especially useful for like small engine carburetors. Get yourself one of these. This is a torch cleaning kit. It's got a bunch of little sticks with knurls on them. You can use that to run through there and clean those out. This is a lifesaver. And two. Next up is our new needle and seat. You may remember the old one had this cup that acted as a crush washer. The new one does not. It has this gasket. All right, now before we put all that stuff that dangles around up in here, let's flip her over and put a new power valve in. Always replace your power valve gaskets. You also wanna make sure he's centered. As you can maybe see, it's hanging off right now despite it beginning to tension on me. Get over there, there we go. Now for the bowl gasket and the power valve cover. All right, that's done. Next up, this is the check valve for the accelerator pump. Fuel can come in when this rubber bends out of the way and the rubber folds back flat and fuel cannot go back into the bowl, but rather has to go to the accelerator pump nozzles. Grab our spring, our new power valve. The metal side goes to the rod that will rub across it. Hook our cover back up to our accelerator pump arm and get him aligned and drop some hardware in it. Tighten these down. Remember, no need to go crazy. Just trying to get that gasket to set. If it leaks a little, you can tighten it more later. Next up is our idle mixture jets. Make sure you uh, blow this passage out as well with air and brake clean or whatever. We're gonna go all the way down until it just touches. If you wrench on this, you will ruin this carburetor because where that needle sits will be all galled up and it'll never flow the same again. We'll go two and a quarter. Grab our new needle. If you change the seat, you gotta change the needle too. They're usually designed to match and they're not all compatible with each other depending on what brand made your rebuild kit. Once that needle's on, don't forget this spring. He sits under the tab and against the wall. Grab a screwdriver, press him down into place. There should be a little measurement stick. Hop on Google, figure out what your float height's supposed to be. Put your choke arm back in place if you haven't already. And last but not least, grab your gasket. 
and your top cover and drop that sucker into place. Four screws on top. Stud for the air cleaner. Hook up your choke again. Mine's broke. I gotta figure out a solution for that yet. And there you go. You have yourself a backyard Berryman's bucket carburetor rebuild. Let's go slap this sucker on the truck and see how she does. All right, we are back to the truck finally. Make sure if you have one of these spacers that you replace the gasket on both sides. The installation of this guy is pretty much the exact opposite of removal. There is one thing I want to mention though. This is not a lug nut. Hell, it's not even a set of spark plugs. Don't go cranking down on these carb bolts. It does not take a lot to warp the base of a carburetor. And you'll get all sorts of air leaks around your throttle shaft seals and the base gaskets. And stuff's just going to get all sorts of dorked up. So don't go cranking down on these. Just make it snug. Here's some fuel. Now, when you rebuild the carb, especially seemingly small engine stuff, it's not uncommon the first time you hit it with fuel that the needle and seat will stick. So I like to just, you know, get in there and give it some preemptive taps. We got an accelerator pump. Let's see if it runs. But as you can see, that thing was shaking all over. If a motor's running smooth, it shouldn't really move too much. Ideal scenario, perfect motor. You can balance a nickel right here. It seems we have a number of large misfires. That could be plug wires. That could be plugs. And it could be, what I'm leaning to in this case scenario, bent push rods. These FEs love to bend the hell out of push rods. As you can see, that's the angle the push rod should be traveling. Instead, it's going way off to the left, so that one has come out of the lifter cup. I don't know if that's because it's bent or what, but... I should really watch old videos before I start on a project. I've just been repeating myself this whole time. I remember parking this truck and saying it needs a new motor, but I, I can't remember why. I think this is why. <laughs> Shit, now what? Let's pull this valve cover and see what's going on again. Alright, let's see if these are all stuck. <laughs> All right, well, everything moves. The valves are all moving. This this push rod's definitely bent, so we'll we'll get him out and get him straightened, but it looks better than I thought it would in here. Let's just say that. All right, four bolts. Here we go. How are you looking? A little bendy. And the one we're most concerned about is not bent. What? I guess maybe the lifter's not pumping up. That looks less bent than the one that was bent last time. So the lifter's on top of the camshaft our little hydraulic plungers that when oil pressure is present they extend if they don't build pressure for some reason or they leak down they don't hold pressure this will happen you'll get a really loose valve a really noisy valve like that i can straighten this better other than that i need to go think about this for a bit make a plan all right let's do a little bit of science i've got fuel in the tank it is feeding accelerator pumps working just fine our valve train is back on the valve cover is off so I can watch that and see if I can figure out where the noise is coming from. And then I've got a pair of pliers here that are insulated that I'm going to grab these one at a time if we can get this thing to idle and unplug one cylinder at a time to see if we can identify which cylinders are problematic. If they make no difference when I do this, that's the one that's a problem. If the engine slows down, that one seems to be working. Let's give it a try. <laughs> Classic 2100 only idles on full choke scenario. Yep, <laughs> once again. What is it with these damn 2100s? Anything less than full and it shuts off. Why do these carburetors do this to me? I don't get it. Ah, I see it now. See how much this one's moving in comparison to this one? That's a wiped cam load. That's why we have so much play and so much noise. 
That one's good. That one's good. That one's good. That one's no good. That one's no good. That one's really good. Really, really good. And that one's good. These two are dead. It's also quite interesting to see no oil up there. That's a rough cutter. Just like that, it's done. Well, the good news is this one cylinder came back to life when it sped up randomly. Uh, the other one didn't, though. So it's oh, it's not plugged in on this end. Look at that, and it's broke. I bet that would make a difference. All right, new plug wire. Let's see if this idles on all eight. Oh. <laughs> still will not idle without choke, but that's a lot smoother. For the next hour, I went through the Venturi assembly with a fine tooth comb and confirmed it was perfectly fine. For the life of me, I could not figure out why this carburetor would not idle without full choke. Eventually, I gave up and changed my goals to just getting this thing to drive closer to the shed so I didn't have to walk so far for tools every time. I poured some used motor oil on the valve train since it wasn't oiling itself and fired her back up. Ticking. She's clattering. She's smoking. Specifically out one side. <laughs> on the wood just move forward are you kidding me oh that was weird okay it was in like two. Oh, hey the brakes work all right second gear might have might be gone now all right we're committing to it come on all the way to the backyard yes no power steering but I don't know if it's supposed to it doesn't feel like it Holy shit, we're driving it. Speedometer works. Fuel gauge kind of works. Temp gauge works. Alternator light works, unfortunately. Oh my gosh, the horn works too. Well, now it's worth putting a motor in. Let's hope the brakes work. Eh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Minor goal one has been achieved. Drive to shed. All right, Mr. Truck, here's the deal. You're gonna sit here all night and let that heat cycle that we just got in you dissipate real nice. And then tomorrow I'm going to come around and take those rockers off, see if we can clean them up, see if we can get those valves to at least stop clattering so much. I'm not done with this engine yet. It's done with the world, it's done with me. That's made that very obvious. But I want to pull a couple more tricks out of the hat. So that being said, I'm going to head into town, get some supper, take a little mental break from this nightmare, and we'll be back tomorrow morning. All right, it's Thursday. I have a plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a little more elbow grease in this motor, pull off some tricks, whatever we can maybe do to get this thing to run as good as it possibly can. And then we're going to take it out to the asphalt and see if it'll actually do a burnout. If you remember how the last video ended, we tried to do a burnout and it did not have the balls to do it. So our goal today is to fix that. Try to do a burnout one last time in that old motor, see if we either kill it or smoke the tires. And then next time we'll put a motor in it. With that being said, after sitting all night, 
Let's see how she fires up. Oh. Okay. That's that's actually pretty respectable. Why do you why are you so quiet today? Don't tell me you want to idle without choke. I won't believe that for a half second. All right, make up your mind. Are you lean or rich? What? What is happening now? Dumping fuel into the carb. Do we have a needle and seat failure? None of this makes sense. I didn't touch anything. What in the hell is happening? The, the valve noise is even stopped. I just hear the one tick. What? <laughs> what is going on right now? I have. You know what? Here's my best guess. This thing sat for like 15 years. Yesterday we got the motor warmed up. Drove it all the way over here and parked it and it got cold last night. I think that big heat cycle and sitting with oil on the rings all night might have freed up the rings and they're sealing better. And now the motor has more compression and it's less temperamental. That or some fuel sitting in the carburetor ate through a deposit somewhere and now the idle mixture, I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm not gonna complain, but I just, I don't even, I don't even have any advice to give right now. What the hell? Turn the idle up a little bit. It's... Well, let's spin it around so I get some sun in the engine bay and see if we can fix that one rod, I guess. It's lean. Uh, the timing's terrible, but it's doing it. It's driving. Holy crap. All right, well, that's the first time putting the tools down and getting a beer instead of working on something actually fixed it. Usually that's just an excuse to be done for the day. But no, I, I had a beer about it and now it's just fine. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of bush light. What can I say? This has been the weirdest week of working on something. Well, I suppose at this point we might as well just jump into moving the timing and stuff around, see if we can get this thing to idle worth the crap. And then we'll deal with that rocker. I mean, there's not a ton I can do for that, but I, I do have an idea to try. I'm not gonna go over ignition timing and stuff in this video, especially because I don't have a timing light. I'm just gonna tune this off ear. Uh, if you wanna see that, I will link it right up here. There's a great video I did on carburetors and tuning your carburetor. Step one to tuning your carburetor is say your ignition right. Nine times out of 10, it's actually ignition issues that make your car run like crap and people start messing with their car raiders and get them way out of whack. So that video is like an hour long or something. So I'm not going to include it in here because there's a lot of in-depth knowledge, uh, but I start very basic. So if you've never done this before, that's the video you need to watch. All right, let's fire this up and see if I can get it to idle a little cleaner. doesn't hate me after all. It's, this is a power steering truck. What? Why no worky? Oh, I suppose that would do it. It's completely out of fluid. All right, time for the push rod. Okay, I got a rocker shaft off. Still not really much of a sign of any oil having never come out of those. There's also no sign of it draining back here. If you can see, there's a puddle there and no hole. There's supposed to be a nice big hole like that right there. This one is plugged. I'm gonna get in here with a screwdriver and oh yeah, it's <laughs> oh boy. There she goes. Ooh, yum. Yeah, if we get that oil to actually start flowing, it needs a place to return. Otherwise, it'll fill the valve cover, and it's probably not gonna be sealed with the crap. Unless, of course, I can get this to run well enough to be worth two dollars of RTV. But it would fill the valve cover and just dump all over that manifold and smoke a lot, to say the least. Onward with our excavation. 
All right, so I got our drain cleaned out. I had to get a zip tie, shove it in there, and then hit it with some brake clean a whole bunch. But it's flowing. Next step, make sure we've got adequate oil coming out of that hole right there. That is what feeds our rocker shafts. This thing might run on four cylinders. Let's see. Honestly, it runs better than I thought it would for four cylinders. Well, it looks like we got oil being fed to the rockers. Now we just needed to go through the rockers. Let's go clean them up and figure it out. I spent the next few hours disassembling and cleaning the rocker shaft assembly. Once everything was clean, I carefully oiled and reassembled the rocker assembly. Everything here was really straightforward and easy. If you ever do this yourself, just make sure that you put the oiling holes on the rocker on the bottom when you reassemble it, because the valve springs and push rods apply pressure to the bottom of the rocker, not the top. The only other thing to look out for is to make sure that the bolt with the smallest shank goes in the hole that the oil comes from on the block. Boom, there we go. Cleaned up rocker shaft, ready to go back in the truck. Well, here we are, the end of yet another day. At least this time we have a nice sunset. Earlier I sprayed some gunk in here uh, to break down the grease and then I flushed it all off with gasoline. So the, what's in this pan right now is not good. It's petroleum based jungle juice, but we're gonna do an oil change. All right, our rocker is bolted on. I've got some oil that I poured all over the valves and everything. Took these spark plug wires back up, light this thing off and see if it'll oil the valves itself. We should see oil collecting down in these trays and maybe a little out of these holes. Come on. Show me some oil. Come on, little buddy. You can do it. Really seeing what I thought I would. Oh, oh. Well, I just discovered that my brand new bottle of Marble Mystery Oil got cracked and was leaking, actively. So I said, screw it, and dumped like two, two and a half quarts in here. And we're gonna let this stuff run for a while, and get nice and warm, and run all that excessive amount of Marble Mystery Oil around and see if it maybe clears up that lifter port, and that lifter starts oiling, and that noise goes away. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but we all know this thing was. There's a lot of thump, 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 and bang, 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 down in the bottom end. This motor's had it. This thing is white, dude. I cannot believe that we got it to run this good. This old girl has absolutely had it. She's got the lifter clattering like hell. The bottom end sounds like a pile of monkeys with hammers down there. I can't believe it hasn't spat a rod, honestly. But I did figure out a way to get this to quiet down. Look at that. That's all it takes. Good morning folks and welcome to Friday. It is the last day I have to work on this thing. This morning I had to go into the office and do a little computer work and while I was there I uh, lengthened our push rod. Is this the correct way to fix this problem? No. Do I have time to do it the right way? No. Will it stop all the lifter noise and open the valve all the way? Yes. Are we going to call that fixed? Yes. Alright, how did I do? <laughs> it's like perfect. Hell yes. Last night, I ran the Marble Mystery Oil in here. Uh, the only thing it changed was turn the oil light on at idle because it thinned the oil out, which is what it does, and then probably proceeded to really give the bearings a good beating on the bottom end. They might still be alive, we'll find out. With that being said, our last step is to do an oil change, put some 20W50 in there and see if that will fix all the horrible rod knocking noises we were having from below. All right, let's do an oil change to find out. Did you know, if you're ever stuck in a pinch and you don't have a filter wrench, you can take an oil filter off with just a pair of pliers. There she goes. Easy peasy. 
Not a lot of oil came out of that, and there's not a lot of oil in here. Interesting. Now remember kids, if you have an old motor, it will have a flat tappet camshaft, not a roller camshaft, and you need to add zinc to your oil. I will not be doing that today because I don't anticipate this thing to live for 10 minutes. I don't think it's worth wasting $4 or $8 in STP additive on. Do as I say, not as I do. All right, Mr. Engine, I have done everything I can for you. It is now your time to perform for me. Let's see what you can do. I just turned the key on. It's doing that thing it did on the very first day that miraculously went away where it only runs when I hit the start button. Please fix yourself again. This thing hates me. Come on. There we go. No lifter noise. That pressure. And no bottom end noise. You son of a bitch. <laughs> Just goes to show a little cleaning and thick oil will bring a motor back to life. A lot of people write these off as dead long before they're dead because they run stock weight oil at 530 in this motor for 120,000 miles when they should have bumped it up to 1040 or 2050 in severe cases 50, 60,000 miles ago and got twice the life out of their motor. Viscosity is key and you'll never know your true pressure unless you put a mechanical gauge on it. In this case, it didn't matter. It was so junk, it was either gonna be 2050 or gear oil. happens when the oil gets warm and thins out but uh this thing might not be done with life after all man i knew it was too good to be true i knew this truck wasn't done with me yet there is a huge and i mean huge rear main leak it was pouring out of there's probably a quart on the ground it wasn't even doing that before how does it just start doing that suddenly Ugh. all right well junk after all <laughs> And it runs so good now. It just fires right off. Oh, the off idle is excellent. What, like, what is it? Why? Why, truck? Power steering works. Transmission goes right into gear. The brakes work incredible. And the rear main is dumping a trail of oil. Why are you not doing me like this? That's just rude. You can't win them all, folks, but if you fight hard enough, you can win most of them. And I've won most of this truck over. Let's strap this sucker to a tree or something and do a burnout. That's worse than the wagon. <laughs> Why? Well, thank you guys very much for joining us on today's episode of Junkyard Digs. I hope you learned that you can do this kind of debauchery by yourself at home with nothing more than hand tools laying out in the grass the whole time. did a burnout. We'll see you guys next week. Peace. Keep an eye on the channel. I'm not done with this truck because it's still good enough to deserve a whole new motor. Holy shit. And it is screaming for one. Oh boy. Oh come on. I didn't even spin it that much. It's going flat. And of course it switched tires after I reset the camera.